journalist Chris Hutchins from the New Musical Express, traveled with the Beatles while they were touring the States in August 1965. That same month, the magazine reported that they were arranging a meeting between the Beatles and Elvis Presley. Chris Hutchins wrote, This palm-filled star-studded city is about to stage the production of the century, the meeting of Elvis Presley and the Beatles. I can reveal it is about to take place after visiting Elvis and learning that the singer from Memphis and the group from Liverpool still run something of a mutual admiration. Now I have the job of setting up the historic meeting. Yesterday's meeting with Elvis was my first. I took the day off from leaving with the Beatles, to spend it with manager Colonel Tom Parker at Paramount Studios, where Elvis is filming Paradise Hawaiian Style. We were on our way to lunch when the colonel led me through a door into a darkened room. Elvis was there watching television. The light went on and he jumped up to shake hands. He was as courteous as his reputation promised. I told him we had been surprised to learn he was back in Los Angeles. Elvis said, we got through filming in Hawaii sooner than expected and came straight back to finish the picture in the studio. Elvis asked for news of the Beatles tour, and asked if they were comfortable in the ranch house they had rented in Benedict Canyon, just outside Beverly Hills. Elvis said, my girlfriend drove up around there yesterday and she said there were a heck of a lot of fans outside, those guys can't get much peace at all can they? Although the location was supposed to have been a well-kept secret, somehow scores of teenagers managed to find out where the Beatles were staying and many of them are up here now. And uh, you knew that they were here by the fact that uh, some of your peers, other kids, were up here, right? Yeah, yeah, they told us. So that was your clue? Yeah. <laughs> you glad you saw them? Yeah, I wish I could see them come out, though. I wanted to get another picture of them. In the afternoon, I was taken to the Paradise Hawaiian-style film set. At the end of the afternoon's filming, I took the colonel up to the Beatles' house. When he visited their house, Colonel Tom Parker answered questions from the Beatles about why Elvis no longer tours or why he only records film songs. The colonel said, Elvis is unavailable for personal appearances because of filming commitments. I've just sent his gold Cadillac on a tour of America. As a matter of fact, it's so successful that I'm thinking of putting his gold suit on tour. As he left, he assured the Beatles that they would have their long-cherished meeting with Elvis. A week later, the new Musical Express reported that Chris Hutchins had managed to arrange the meeting. Chris Hutchins wrote, Elvis Presley was playing bass guitar with the benefit of a little instruction from Paul McCartney, and John Lennon was on rhythm guitar. The record they were backing was Scylla Black's You're My World. John exclaimed, this beats talking doesn't it? The world's number one solo star and the world's number one group were meeting for the first time and communicating through music. The get-together took three days of planning and was shrouded in secrecy to avoid two armies of Beatles and Presley fans gathering in one spot. The Beatles had accepted Presley's invitation to spend last Friday evening, August 27, at his home in Bel Air. It was my great privilege to be the only journalist invited. There is not a single picture in existence to record the great event, no cameras were allowed. Colonel Parker escorted the Beatles to Presley's home shortly after 10 p.m. The police stopped traffic to prevent fans tailing them. One of Parker's associates and I collected Brian Epstein from Los Angeles airport and we arrived at the house a few minutes after the Beatles. When we entered, Elvis was sitting with Paul on one side and his girlfriend on the other. John sat next to Paul and George was cross-legged on the floor. Ringo was at the other side of the room inspecting Presley's collection of records. They were watching a color television set in the center of the room but the sound was switched off. Later, an American hit blared from his record player, Mohair Sam by Charlie Rich. Elvis said, somebody bring in the guitars. And one of the ten pals he employs as his constant companions obliged. Three guitars were plugged into amplifiers scattered around the room. Here's how I play the bass, not too good but I'm practicing, Elvis told Paul, and he joined to accompany a record on the player. John added a few chords while George studied the third instrument before playing. That's how it went for the first hour, Elvis John and George providing the costliest ever backing to a selection of British and American discs, including one by The Shadows. Presley gave the occasional hint of his famous wiggle even though he was seated in his chair strumming the bass part to each record. 
Ringo looked at the guitarists without smiling. Elvis consoled him. Too bad we left the drums in Memphis, Presley said. I wandered around the room. A white grand piano occupied a corner by the bar and next to it was a jukebox which contained no British records and only one by its owner, returned to sender. Presley's companions kept up a supply of drinks for the Beatles. But the host himself neither touched one nor accepted any of the cigarettes offered by those who either didn't read or didn't believe his biographies. Even in this relaxed carefree atmosphere, I never heard him swear. I'm sure the Beatles were as impressed as I was with his balanced way of life. This is the way it should be, Lennon said in a mock Peter Sellers accent. The small homely gut earring with a few friends and a little music. Elvis smiled. At the back of the room, Brian Epstein and Colonel Parker sat chatting. They were watching over their stars like parents. They later adjourned for a little roulette in the games room. When they tired of their music, they sat back and relaxed. Our host said, some funny things happen to you on the road, don't they? I remember once in Vancouver, we'd only done a number or two when they rushed to the stage. They tipped the whole rostrum over. Paul said, we've had some crazy experiences. One fellow rushed on stage, pulled the leads out of the amplifiers and said, one move and you're dead. Elvis commented, it used to get pretty scary at times. John said, but you're just one. At least we've got each other up there. If somebody pushed me on stage and said that I was on my own like they did with you, I'd just break up. The conversation turned to planes and Presley told the Beatles of some of the experiences that had unnerved him for flying. Presley said, I once took off from Atlanta in a small plane that had only two engines and one of them failed. I was really scared, I thought my number was really up. We had to remove sharp objects from our pockets and rest our heads on pillows between our knees. When we landed, our pilot was soaking wet with sweat although there was snow on the ground outside. In return, George related the story of his flight from Liverpool when the window beside him sprang open. The talk of close shaves exhausted and the topic switched to cars. Elvis said, I've got a Rolls-Royce Phantom 5. Lennon said, mine's just the same. I've had all the chrome bits painted black though. Shortly before 2 a.m., early for the Beatles but late for Elvis, someone decided it was time to go. Long before the song Softly As I Leave You by Matt Monroe was spinning on the record player as the Beatles shook hands with Elvis inside his home. The Beatles thanked him for the large boxes of all his records each one had received from Colonel Parker on Presley's behalf. As they climbed into their limousine in the courtyard, a handful of fans chanted Elvis is king and we love the Beatles alternatively. All the way home, John Paul George and Ringo chatted about the experience and agreed that the meeting was an unforgettable and pleasant highlight of their lives.